Her name is Nomondo Kalata. She's the widow of one of the leaders of our freedom struggle in South Africa, Fort Kalata, one of four young men waylaid, detained, tortured, and murdered by the South African security police in 1985. I preached at their funeral in July of 1985. In 1996, Mrs. Talata testified before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission under the leadership of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. She had hardly started to speak when she suddenly broke down, threw her body backwards like this, and opened her mouth in a primeval scream of pain and suffering and grief. She did this, ah! Oh, and it went on and on and on. The TRC and Archbishop Tutu and the people in the hall listened in stunned silence. They were awed. And this is how a journalist present there that day describes the moment. The starting point of the hearing, she says, was the indefinable wail that burst forth from the Monday Kalata's lips, the signature tune, the defining moment, the intimate sound of what this process is all about. And ever since that scream was uttered that day, the question is what pathways to peace, reconciliation, nonviolence, justice, and dignity does Nomonde Kalata open for us? The call to reconciliation, the necessity of reconciliation, the challenges, the risks that come with it, its meaning, are all embodied in that one cry. Today, almost 20 years after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, after the euphoria of a freedom fought for but not yet gained, after forgiveness given but justice denied, after sacrifices made in hope on top of sacrifices made in struggle, and with Nomondo Talata's cry still ringing in our ears and in our hearts, we have learned in South Africa to speak of reconciliation, but less triumphantly, more thoughtfully, with less certitude but with more conviction, with more humility and even greater consciousness of the presence of God. When we speak of reconciliation now, we cannot do so without first taking the shoes off our feet, for it is holy ground. That cry was a cry against the injustices that choked our daily lives against the relentless violence of systems of oppression, of deadly assault and torture that killed her husband, against the helplessness that is the spawn of hopelessness with which oppression always works in hopes of breaking our spirit and our will to resist. But if we listen well, we will hear that cry for it is everywhere where people are despised and discriminated, derided and subjected, everywhere where people are oppressed and excluded and exterminated because of their economic status in life or their lack of education or their gender or their sexual orientation or their religion, their race or the color of their skin, everywhere where they discover that their powerlessness makes them vulnerable to abuse. Black Lives Matter is such a cry. Uh, resistance against endless war for endless profits and world domination is such a cry. Uh, the cry against the oppression of women and patriarchal violence is such a cry. The cry to end the violence against the LGBTQI community is such a cry. The cry from occupied Palestine is such a cry. The cry from the children of Flint still drinking poison water is such a cry. Namondo Talata did not cry in an appeal to an apartheid regime no longer in place. She did not hear 
or they did not hear her 11 years ago, they could not hear her now. And like all oppressors who live off the pain of their victims, they never intended to hear her. And if they could hear her, they heard her in the way that all oppressors, all torturers, all lovers of violence of yesterday and today always hear, as the cry that merely confirms their power, their control over others, and their ability to inflict pain or to end pain. Nomondo did not cry so that those commissioners could have sympathy with her. Eleven years after the death of her husband, that sympathy would not have been of much help. That cry was beyond the TRC, for she understood that they could not give her justice, not justice as revenge and punishment, wishing the violence visited upon her husband, upon her and her children, and upon a whole community and a people whose only desire was freedom and dignity, to in turn be inflicted upon the torturers of her husband sitting in front of her. But the justice of violent retribution of a blood-filled self-gratification is not the justice Mrs. Talata wanted. She cried for justice, not for the dead, but for justice for the living, because justice for the dead could only be retribution. But justice for the living is the justice that breaks down systems of oppression, that transforms societies, that works towards the restoration of rights and dignity and equity and seeks the healing of persons and communities, the justice that is able to create a future. Retribution can never do that. She did not cry to white South Africa either, the majority of whom did not want to hear such a cry, who recoiled from it because the hardness of their unrepented hearts could only fearfully conceive of a black revenge, of desperate excuses for the inexcusable, or of a feverish desire to just move on. Their wish was not for her or her family to find peace, but for the whole country to seek refuge in a collective amnesia. She did not cry to the black community who, if they were not consumed by such rage that revenge was indeed their only thought, would be in too much pain themselves, still in mourning for their own disappeared and for children and parents and siblings and other family members who died sudden or slow, but always painful and always unnecessary and always a too early death. Namonda's cry was a cry for truth, but not the legal truth that so easily becomes vulnerable to technicalities in a court of law legal slate of hand before a judge, uh, not the devastating historical truth, namely this atrocity actually happened, and my husband's tortured body is the proof of it. Her cry was a cry beyond the factual truth. Here is the report of the independent pathologist together with those pictures she will never get out of her mind, contrasting so sharply with the mendacity that permeates the official reports of the government's pathologists. Neither was she looking for social truth that could be confirmed by those in the oppressed communities who were in the struggle. We were there. We fought side by side with your husband. We recall the prison and the torture and the pain and the humiliation and the fear. We know this to be true because we were there. No, the cry was for something deeper, for the truth of wounded memories. Uh, the man, she was saying, you are talking about was a fighter for justice, yes. He was a leader of his people, yes. He was admired by those who knew his courage and revered by so many because his love for justice made them strong, yes. But a human being died that night in your, cha your chamber, um, and he was also my husband and my friend and my lover and the father of my children. That cry was a cry for the Truth Commission and the people of South Africa and perhaps 
the world who was watching to understand the true meaning of reconciliation. The TRC hearings were always in danger of becoming no more than political theater. The dramatic revelation and acknowledgement of unspeakable things, uh, a nation momentarily holding its breath, wondering which way this would go, which would win, the very basic instinctual urge for violent retribution, or the more difficult reach toward the justice that forgives and transforms and restores, the justice informed and sustained by genuine love for the other. But reconciliation is much more than just a negotiated path toward amnesty. It is, Christians are reminded, a call for Christian discipleship. It is a gospel imperative. It is a call upon us by the God who in Jesus Christ is at work reconciling the world unto God's self. Hence, reconciliation, the Apostle Paul tells us, is a ministry entrusted to us. And therefore, it is not an option. As if we can weigh other options, we can consider the feasibility and the risks take into account the political possibilities and the economic consequences, make decisions on minimalist versus maximalist approaches, hoping for the safe middle ground, hedging against the shocking demands of the gospel with calculated, preempted incrementalism. Reconciliation is a calling. It is the very essence of costly discipleship. So in the Monday's cry, was even more than just the collective grief apartheid brought or the collective outrage against the horrors of apartheid. It is a cry amidst the political theater, amidst the human drama and political maneuverings. It wanted to create amidst all of that space, a sacred space for true reconciliation. The Monday's cry was saying you cannot understand reconciliation, you cannot begin the work of reconciliation unless you first hear the cry. Hearing that cry, opening your ears and your hearts to that cry, letting your soul be touched, no, no, scorched by that cry is the first step, she was saying. Hear with your eyes, Truly open and see with your opened eyes and understand with your open mind and stretch out your open hand to undo the damage your violence and your greed and your lust for power and domination has inflicted upon others. Reconciliation is not possible unless that cry is heard. And so this is what Nomonde Kalata did that morning. And in crying out, she cried to God. Not the racist, genocidal god of apartheid who blessed our oppression and made the Afrikaner people so exceptional, that exceptionalism that does what exceptionalism always does, make for themselves a god whose chosen people they become with the right to steal and destroy and enslave and dehumanize. She did not cry out to the god of pacification. Black people were told to believe in and too often did. The God who has children, whose lives are precious, and at the same time, stepchildren, whose lives do not matter. The God who takes no issue with injustice, the God who blesses violence, the God whose prophets cry, peace, peace, where there is no peace. She cried out to the God of justice and peace and of love and compassion, of grace and mercy. Hence that cry is not only a definitive moment, it is a defining moment. And for people of faith, it is also a decidedly self-critical moment. I say that because in South Africa, we, who knew better, people of faith, uh, fail to make of our reconciliation the process that would become the real radical revolution and transformational reality. We know that the Bible tells us it should be. We have not been willing or ready to understand that reconciliation, if it is to be meaningful, durable, and sustainable, should be real and radical and revolutionary. It is real and not a cover for political pietism and Christian quietism. It is radical 
because it is about much more than harmonious personal relationships. It is about the restoration of justice and rights and human dignity. It is never shallow, but it goes to the roots of things. And it is revolutionary because it seeks the transformation of persons and societies, their systems and structures. It seeks the transformation of the world. It is the ministry through which God is reconciling the world unto God's self. The Mondas Cry was telling us that biblical reconciliation, other than the reconciliation we confuse with political negotiation and political drama, is fundamentally different. Reconciliation is not possible without acknowledging the causes of the alienation that now calls for reconciliation. It is not possible without confronting the evil of the past and the present, including the evil within ourselves that refuses to acknowledge the evil of the past and the present because that evil happens to benefit us. It is not possible without justice. It is only possible amongst equals. It is not possible without remorse and repentance, and it is not possible without forgiveness. Forgiveness is a word that easily trips off our tongues. Christians use it effortlessly and ceaselessly and thoughtlessly. In South Africa, we did not consistently, publicly, and prophetically remind the nation that forgiveness is indispensable but never sentimental, that forgiveness has personal, communal, and political dimensions, that forgiveness res includes respectful room for righteous anger. We did not insist that forgiveness is always the prerogative of the victim, never the right of the perpetrator, that forgiveness is a gift never earned but always freely given, and that forgiveness that follow repentance is a soul-restoring, life-giving act, but without the reciprocity of justice, it becomes in the world of an old African preacher that I met one day, a forgiveness that kills. We did not prophesy to the nation, as journalist Elna Busak urged us to understand, that there are things that while they might be forgivable, are never excusable. And so we did not understand that only through the grace of God do the inexcusable become forgivable. And we never asked what the political implications in our situation of that might be. So the mundo talatai's cry, my friends, is not really an indefinable wail. It is a ringing call to conversion. It is a cry to us to listen, to hear, and to respond, and having heard, then to walk in the ways of justice, peace, and love. Mrs. Talata says that she had not really cried in all the time since 1985. First, she says, it was because people told her, being pregnant at the time, if she cried, it would emotionally disturb the baby. And in grief that deep certainly would do that. But I wonder whether she had not ever cried in the privacy of her home, perhaps. But then I thought about the fact that she had small children. And in our cramped, tightly packed, thin-walled township dwellings built for black people, there is no such thing as privacy in your home or from the neighbors next door. And so maybe she did not cry knowing how devastating for a child it is to see the tears of a parent. So why did she choose the TRC, this most public of public platforms in front of the nation and in front of an international television audience to utter that wail. I think it was because that moment was her first encounter with the torturers of her husband, with their arrogance, their unrepentant braggadocio, and their offensive certitude that there was really nothing that she could do to them. It was a moment she could not face without her God, so that also became her moment before her God, to confront God with her unreleased grief, with her unrelieved pain, and her unanswered questions. For her, that was the moment when the words from the Bible became inescapably but mockingly real. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Beloved, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. But what does it mean when your grief has torn your soul apart? 
And so that is why the cry was beyond the understanding of those who heard it. But because it was a cry to God, it was also a cry of resistance. Not resistance against apartheid, but resistance against the temptation to hate the men in front of her, to inflict upon them the, the pain they made her husband endure for three weeks, uh, the pain that would never leave her or her children. It was, it was a resistance against the temptation to shun them, to simply turn her back on them, to shame them, to make them feel something of the shame they should have felt in killing her husband, but even now seemed incapable of feeling. It was a cry to God because she knew that in that hearing, on that stage, in that politically created moment where so much was predetermined and so much was at stake, so much beyond her will or reach, she was powerless. She needed a power that was beyond her earthly power. She knew that on her own, she would not be able to make it through that moment. She needed from God the strength she would never be able to muster on her own. From God she needed the love even for these men to overcome a hatred that would have been completely understandable and natural. From God she needed the power to offer a forgiveness that would bring healing but not forgetfulness. From God she needed the grace to find a peace anchored in something deeper than the false peace of quietism, of resignation, or managed desperation. And every moment in that hearing was a terrifying, violent onslaught upon her unhealed soul. And the cry was not the cry of an emotionally disturbed or distraught or unstable woman. It is as if in that moment she had heard Thomas Merton that the Archbishop explained to us so beautifully a peace produced by grace is a spiritual stability too deep for violence. And therefore, I put in brackets, it is unshakable. That is what she left behind, and that is what is driving hundreds and thousands of young people on the streets of South Africa today to even now, in a nonviolent fashion, reclaim the justice that they were denied 22 years ago. The violence that killed her husband in front of her set those violent men of the apartheid regime's killing machines. In their eyes, she could still see, if she had wanted to, the simmering violence that tortured her husband with a blowtorch, the doctor determined. Was it the calm, detached violence of a person only doing his job? Was it the dedicated violence only intent on getting information, his well-trained mind always ready to call it something else, not violence, but something useful, something politically prepackaged, uh, something palatable, a euphemism like enhanced interrogation techniques, perhaps. Was it a gleeful violence, such of one drenched in hatred of black people, or the fanatic, sacralized violence of one doing this for God and country? In the end, it did not matter. Like Hannah in the first book of Samuel, Namonda Kalata cried out against the violence surrounding her, pouring out her soul before God, from whom she expected mercy and peace and grace. And like Hannah, Namonda knew that there is no rock like our God. Like Hannah, she knew that in the face of violence, the bow of the mighty are broken, while the feeble gird on strength. And that's a strength to endure and to forgive and to love. That's why she cries out. And uttering that cry is the beginning of life renewed, of hope restored, of struggle rejuvenated, of sacred wisdom reclaimed. So, the men who tortured her husband and walked away that day unrepentant and untouched, do they have peace? No. But Nomondo Talata has peace. It is a peace resting in faith. It is unshakable. It is a peace that empowered her to forgive. It is unshakable. 
It is a peace nestling in the grace of God. It is unshakable. It is a peace inspiring new generations to continue. It is unshakable. Is it hard? Yes. Is it fragile? Yes. Is it under siege? Yes. But it is now and forever will be unshakable. Thank you.